Okay. I'm resident of Colwood and I have no sanity left. My guests are my buddy Patrick McRae, author of The Dark Shadows Day Book and Bound, and my buddy Gordon Damowski. We're here to discuss episode 793, chosen by, by Gordon. Lewis Edmonds narrates this. Mm-hmm. Gordon Russell is the writer. Uh, Leela Swift is the director of this episode. I, I I know, I think I know why you picked this episode, Gordon, but go ahead and explain to me why you picked this episode. Just, just do it. Well, uh, I, I've noticed that, that the two of you tend to go for more of the the obscure, the 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 hidden gem within within the the, the series. And and in one of yours case, you go so far and it's like you wonder what what the hell's going on? Like why? It's like the it's like looking um it's like looking for the Jerry Lewis cover of Polk Salad a- Annie in a KTEL collection. <laughs> and I thought and I thought I would go for, for this for this episode for a couple of reasons. One is um it's a Gordon Russell written, written episode and I wanted to highlight how good he is as a writer. Um and secondly, it's um, it's got Big Lou. Um, but more importantly, it's the introduction of a very important character who 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 brings a lot to the Dark Shadows mythos. And and that character is Ar- Michael Stroka is Aristide. I mean, he is he is the Harry Johnson of 1897. And I will die on that hill. I would agree. I would I would uh, I would I would lie down and die with you. Uh, you know, in an appropriate sense. Yeah. We get the I- introduction of Victor Finn Givens, who later, by episode 800, is going to be revealed as Count Andreas Patafi, who is looking for oh, his... Oh, he was in this episode? I didn't see him. Oh, all right. <laughs> You're making the ha-ha. You all the time making the ha-ha. <laughs> This episode starts off. Angelique has got a dog. She's gonna. She's seducing Aristide, and she chokes. She chokes him with, with the handkerchief around the neck, oh. which is his. No. And oh. she gets. She wants to know where the hands buried. So he tells her. Then she continues to choke him unconscious, and then that's where we meet. Uh, Victor Van Givens and he slaps Aristide. Where's the hand? Which is like holy heck, who's this dude? And then he shows up at Collawood with the letter from the Duke of Earl. No, the Earl of Hampshire. The Earl of Hampshire, sorry. <laughs> the... <laughs> what are those Earls? What are the uh, Earls? Joel, did you even watch the episode, or did you? Are you just I going did. off of memory? Did I love the Duke of Earl though? That's perfect. One of one of the Earls, but Earl Chai. <laughs> The Earl of Mankey. The Earl of Mankey. The Earl of Skanky. Yes. What did you guys think of the way, because they're not going to reveal, we know, we all know this is Count Patefe. But what did you guys think of the way they introduced the character overall? They don't introduce him as Patefe. He comes in as a completely different identity. Well, exactly. Um, yeah, I, dead on. I mean, sort of, sort of, because you know, we all we see his, we see him sort of plotting with Aristide. So, um, you know, I mean, there's a, you know, there's, th- we already know that he is not exactly who he appears to be, and it's, it's, it's in sort of the Barnabas tradition because normally. We either immediately or very, very, very quickly are brought in on the secret, you know, um, uh, you know, in in this case that I think Aristide is strong enough for a man, but he is made for a woman ultimately. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, you know, and I think that secret is a is a worthwhile one. So, you know, uh, no, but seriously, we're 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 brought in on on the big secret, so so we we know that he's up to no good. Mm-hmm. Gordon, what did you think? Well, I think uh, along Patrick's lines, you know, you don't. Dark Shadows is really good at how it introduces characters, and also when it does, it never lets you in on the obvious. Ooh, I'm a big villain. I mean, with with Patofi. 
or Victor Van Gibbons. We first see him, he's basically smacking around Aristide, you know, like he's a, you know, like he's, you know, like he's then about to trade Aristide for uh, ramen noodles in prison. Um, <laughs> but then when he comes in, he is super charming. He's like, yeah, here's my letter from the, from the Earl of Hampshire. And he's, he's chanting up that word. You know, he flirts a little bit with, um, Angelique and, and, and I'm going to have to call shenanigans on how you introduced it, how you spoke about their introduction. Angelique was not trying to seduce her as steed. He, she, he was, she was playing with him. You know, this is Angelique at the point, at this point is like, yeah, I'm a witch. I embrace it. And she could have been all, oh, I'm going to kill you. But like, she's like, no, Hey, look at this doll. I can do your voice. Hi, Aristide. Oh, that's not me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's clear that Aristide is the puppet. Angelique yes. is the hand. Yes. Yeah. I really like the fact that you're, they're not revealing the big heel right away. We're, we're building him up. We know that this hand belongs to a Count Patofe. And but we've never seen him. So I love that phrase. And no one the dark shadow. I'm sorry, Jewel, I have to interrupt you. I love that Dark Shadows has gotten us to the fr- to the to the phrase. We know that hand belongs to Count Potofi. And we take it seriously. That's how that's the triumph of this show. Continue. And but we've never seen the character. So, and the gypsies themselves haven't seen Potofi in such a long time. They've forgotten. Uh, Magda has sort of He's forgotten. Not the the, right. He, no one's seen him. So it's been so long. Right. And he's got to get this hand back or else. And it's his hand. So he, empo- <laughs> he employs a plot to go to Collinwood. And, and you notice it's its right hand. I'm, I'm just going to leave that there. It's like Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah, so this is his right hand. And we see Angelique have the box at Collinwood while Lewis Edmonds' his character is talking to her about being married to Barnabas. She, he questions her about how did, he goes, how didn't you know? Like, And she goes, I, I didn't know right away. I found out. And then he put me under his spell. And, you know, being a vampire. So she plays the victim card really well here in this episode, as well as the seduction card in a sense. But I really like the victim card she plays as she's holding the, the box with Count Potofi's hand in it. And here's Victor Ben Givens, who's standing right near her. And she's got the box in her hand. And it's really, really well done. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, if I had to title this episode, it would be called With This Hand. Yeah. What did you guys think of the makeup in this episode with Quentin? Um, I I think it's I think it's hideous. You know, I mean, it, you know, he comes off as uh, as a as a real uh, as a real carny attraction and um and yet they still manage in the hideousness department they still managed to make him uh uh he's he still is handsomer than the hideousness of of Evan Hanley isn't that astounding that you know if if both of them were on the dating game and they were somehow seen in their horrible warped personas you'd still pick Quentin yeah yeah and i like how there's a little piece that hangs off his one cheek and i don't know if that's intentional or if it was like the the you know just they 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 did it but it did, couldn't quite stick and it just makes it look all that much better yeah i really like how awful he looks you're right like with evan hanley's and his like when you compare it yeah evan hanley's is way worse um <laughs> like way way worse Though they, because of Quentin's mangled face, they they can't identify him. I know there's there's an episode where they can't identify who you know who he is in prison because his face is so mangled. That's not this episode, but I love how the mangled face is just he can talk with it now. <laughs> it's like, he makes this arrangement with Angelique, 
Beth Beth has been helping him. Also, Beth Chavez is in this episode. So Terry Crawford's in this episode. And you get Beth, like, she doesn't want to leave. She doesn't want to, like, leave Quentin alone with Angelique. She wants to be there for him. And Angelique, she has ulterior motives. She goes, if you agree to marry me, I'll, I'll fix this. And the hand is, like, on Quentin's body, and it's, like, hurting him. And by the end of this episode, he changes into the werewolf without a full moon, which is, I thought, one, it was really scary, and it was really well done by the effects department to do that right then and there. Really cool. What did you guys think of that? It is a it is a great moment where they set up rules, and then they break them. Mm-hmm. And, and that is, in my opinion, honestly, uh, the essence of horror. He, he said with this thing behind him. Um, because horror is all about ignorance. It's all about going from a place of safety. And, uh, you know, it's weird to say that, you know, being a werewolf is a place of safety. But it, it, it is uh, if you're the werewolf compared to being everyone else around them. But, but seriously, the thing about a werewolf is it's very predictable. It's very cyclical. And... Um, and and that to me was always one of the weaknesses of the the whole werewolf thing is that you know i mean after a while it's just a question of as as barnabas and julia kind of find with the secret room it's a question of just finding a strong enough place to put the werewolf and problem solved um so the fact that suddenly the rules have been thrown out means that even that one level of predictability even the idea of it is the it is not the full moon so we're safe is is gone and suddenly the idea of a werewolf becomes much scarier yeah gordon well yeah i thought it was very effective too because it's it's one of the things that i think gordon russell brings to the show that sam hall it's a very it's He's the yin to Sam Hall's yang. He is the peanut butter to Sam Hall's jelly. Um, he is the wind beneath Sam Hall's wings as much as Sam Hall's the wind beneath his wings. Um, he, I think Sam Hall does the, the he's good at doing all the, the character stuff, but really moving away that moment of really driving the horror. I think Gordon Russell is able to give you a light, a lighter moment and then twist the knife. So like in this scene, you know, Angelique has that conversation. Hey, you you know, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to marry me. And she loses the hand. You see the hand on top of Quentin. And the fact that it goes through that, you have those moments of charm and wit. You know, you've got the whole Fen Gibbons comes in and meets Edward. I think that that scene is very effective. I mean, that's, a hell of a cliffhanger to, to end on, and especially since the show at this time is pretty much like, hey, we're Dark Shadows, we know what we're doing. And I think it really drives that home where Quentin is getting what he's expecting to get and what actually happens are really diametrically opposed because he just wants to look good. I don't even think he's thinking about get rid of the werewolf thing. Gordon is really good at writing... Um... At, at And I think 1897 shows this off exquisitely well. He's very good at writing the aristocracy. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know a lot about Gordon Russell's background, but I get the idea it was, uh, you know, relatively c- comfortable. Uh, Sam's background was, uh, he was a farm boy. He came from a pretty small town. And, um, and so Sam, I also think, though, is really good at going for the gut. You know, Sam Hall is also a very funny writer, but it's a crueler humor. Mm-hmm. It is a tougher humor. It is an angrier humor. Uh, and uh, and and I I agree. Uh, but Gordon, I'm glad you did this because I have to have it pointed out to me when mm-hmm. I when I really because and and part of that is that Gordon Russell's so good. Yeah, and and I, is concealing the art, you yeah. know. And and just to, to give you, there's not much about Gordon Russell, but he was born in Salem, Massachusetts. 
Well, so okay. that would make sense where he understand. And he was also an actor before he became a writer. So you get that sense that he's approaching it with both the understanding of, I know the actor can do this as much as here's the aristocracy and here's where the actual craft comes in. Whereas I think, um, I'm trying to, to think of, uh, if I were to use two kind of hard boiled authors, Sam Hall is Dashiell Hammett and Gordon Russell is Raymond Chandler. They both do hard boiled prose, but I would say that Gordon Russell is a little bit more literary in his ambitions where Sam Hall, and it's not denying his, it's not saying one is better than the other. It's just a different mindset and a different approach. I, I may I may I offer what I think is a is a uh, is a is a slightly different way to articulate that that I it, it probably it it needs to be said, but it's it's probably it's by no means better. But I think uh, uh, Gordon as Chandler right off right on right on. What about what about Sam Hall as Spillane? That would also that would make a lot better sense because Spillane is. I was just reach. Um, I was just. I just finished. There's a new biography of Spillane by Max Allen Collins. Oh uh, well, where? Did, yeah. Yeah, and um, Spillane was pretty much, you know, in public he was always about you know, hey, look, you know, I do this, um, you know, I I write beer and peanuts prose. I never edit. But when you look at it, you know, but the one thing about Spillane's books is you start at page one, you don't stop until the end of the book. And I think Hall has that kind of propulsiveness and that drive and that very basic kind of, you know, he's good at not only getting the terror in, but he gets the plot through. And you, know, you start at minute one, you, you, you fin like he makes the most of those 22 minutes. It, I agree. And, and by, sort of selling themselves as beer and peanuts pros type guys, uh, it allows them the freedom to sneak in tremendous amounts of poetry uh, mm -hmm. without anyone expecting it or demanding it of them. You know, if you say, hey, look, I'm not a poet, look at me for the action and the sex and stuff like that, um, you you have the you you have bought yourself the right for surprising eloquence because because mm -hmm. as long as you provide the other stuff nobody's really looking if you say hey i'm a sophisticated new englander and uh watch me everyone's suddenly going to be judging you uh precisely uh everyone's going to be judging you on your your nimble eloquence uh, and and so I think Sam really got to be kind of a wolf in sheep's clothing with that. Mm -hmm. So did Spillane. You know, there are a lot of passages I read in Spillane that are very beautiful. I mean, they have a they have a sort of a when George Gershwin in his orchestral pieces gets out the horns, you know, and there's something just a little more guttural going on underneath and within these beautiful melodies, you still can't deny that they're beautiful melodies. And that, that's, that's one of the things I like about, I like about St. Paul. But, you know, uh, uh, Christopher Pennock um, really preferred Gordon Russell. And he talked about sort of the sparkle and the wit in, uh, in Gordon's writing, and that they could always tell a Gordon Russell script because of it. You know, it was, it was kind of like Noel Howard a little bit. Um, when did you guys think of Michael Sturck as Aristide? He's much more butch in this. At the beginning, if you listen to his voice, Stroka has not yet given himself the permission or, or had the directors give him the permission to kind of camp him up. There are, there are places when he's first talking to Angelique where you can tell Michael, Michael Stroka is using the voice that he has learned to use in auditions to try out for the parts of leading men. It's not universal. But there are just, I remember there are certain turns of phrase where I almost had to think, is that is that Michael Stroka? Because he wasn't camping it up as much as he later would. Now, that could be because Michael Stroka is getting used to the part. It also could be that Aristide is trying to play a character. Yeah, yeah and also he had that hat on. So he yeah, that great hat. 
They always yeah, introduce him with a wacky hat. Mm-hmm. I think when I look at Aristide in 1897, he's, and I don't mean the writers did this, we're, we're doing this. I think he's a character who we know he's on a mission for, we're going to come to find out he's working for Count Patofi. He's Count one of Count Patofi's agents, if you will. And but we're not, maybe we're not meant to know that he's somebody who's not worried about giving his name or telling you who he is, but he is going to tell you what he's after, and you better hand it over if you have it. Hand it over. <laughs> you said hand. That's like, this is like Pee-wee. That's the secret word. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. You know, Jewel, I remember what you once said to me. Um, you said, Patrick, you when... had lo- lovely lips. Wasn't that it? it? He said you had lovely it was, lips. It was after that, and I do. Um, he said, Patrick, when I, when I look at Aristide, I see who I want to be. When I look at Laszlo, I see who I am. Did he ask you where babies came from? Oh boy. That was a film strip that I had. <laughs> Went, boom. And then the little more narration happened and then. Jewel, are you old enough to know what we're talking about with those? Listen, listen, I was I was present for both my kids' birth. I was south of the border, if you know what I mean. Well, that's exactly. Oh god. Oh, are we talking Tijuana Donkey Show south of the border? Okay, all right, all okay. right. Now keep talking. But no- <laughs> that's back to this. Back to the the Clint Eastwood movie, The Mule. Continue. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> With Dark Shadows, I really like Michael Stroke as Aristide. He really, he displays the ultimate loyalty in any time he's around Patofi. He's loyal to the bone. He's, and, he's Smithers yeah, to, to really Count cool. Patofi's Mr. Burns. Yeah, in a lot of ways, you're right. He He's sort of what, I, I sort of think the Simpsons, the creators of the Simpsons, watch Dark Shadows because when you think of when you think of Aristide, you can think of Smithers, if you will. I, I would like to believe that when Quentin is in Count Patofi's body, uh, you know, occupying it, and uh, and he finally takes a bath, that he sees a lot of tattoos, and that one of the tattoos strategically placed just says "No, Aristide." Continue. But I really like the character of Aristide. I love the fact that he has a knife and he's not afraid to use it as well. Lewis Edmonds in this episode is just a lot of fun. He's questioning Angelique. He's interrogating her. It's great to see him play a character that isn't necessarily mean. He's just firm and direct. And I lo- I really, really love Lewis Edmonds as Edward Collins. Oh, you're talking about one of my favorite characters on the show. Uh, Mm -hmm. who transforms, he really does transform over the course of 1897, but not so much that it's unbelievable. Not so much that that it's it's a totally different person, and we go, okay, this is writing, not living. Uh, And it really, really wants, it, it really makes me want to know what sort of grandfather he was to Roger and Liz. Mm-hmm. And and I actually think he was probably more laid back than Jameson, their dad. Uh, uh, partly because he was able to take so much action against the supernatural. And he had he had so many moments of almost losing his his family and really seeing what was going to happen. I think Edward Collins uh transforms a lot and is hilarious and also just privately i would love to have i would have loved to have seen edward collins unleashed on gabriel if you had put edward collins into 1840 yeah he would have cleaned house he really would have he has no time for that stuff i think yeah i what do you think 
Yeah, I think Edward Collins is one of my he is one of the the most underappreciated characters in all of Dark Shadows because he's not the he's Louis Edmonds playing. He's not playing the absent dad or the you know, he's not Rogers, the absent dad or Daniel as the broken by Barnabas. He's he's a guy who actually manages to get his stuff together over the course of 1897. He's a guy who you could easily imagine a spinoff where um, Edward Collins becomes an occult detective and like yes. fights monsters. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think in the day book, I call him, you know, perhaps the greatest monster hunter of the age, uh, because that's who I see him on the on the trajectory of becoming. Mm -hmm. And honestly, he would be a pretty formidable one. You know, the only what he would need. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Why didn't Big Finish do well? Begin so many sentences with that. Um, you realize that the perfect occult fighting team is the the unlikely buddy team of Quentin and Edward. Yeah. Because Edward's going to be the muscle. Edward's going to be the strategist. Edward is going to be the one to make the really hard decisions. But what Edward can't do is pull a con. Yeah. He's just, mm -hmm. he's too straightforward. And so that's when Quentin has to get out of the carriage and be the, be the mouthpiece. That would have been a hell of a show. Mm -hmm. Ed Edward Collins, paranormal hunter. There you go. Uh, yeah, that was the wild, wild north. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the character. He, He's somebody who embraces fatherhood. He's somebody who cares about his kids. He's you're right. He's not. He's he's not Roger. He's not Joshua. Lewis yeah, Edmonds. He, he, always yeah, kinda, hard. Go ahead. I was about to say you kind of wish Edward would would fa fa would like jump to like nineteen to like nineteen sixty five, smack yeah. Roger around, and say, "What the hell are you thinking? Were yeah. you raised that way?" That I I really and okay okay and so when Roger finally has his great awakening, you know when when he almost loses the kid to Laura for real, and because that's right around the time Barnabas shows up, and it's right around the time that he starts being you know everybody's favorite dad, and he really is, I mean within with the tools he has, Roger really does try. Um, and, and I think that's where he starts listening to Edward, even though Edward's gone. I think that's, I, I or I would like to think, this is all, I guess, what they call head cannon, but I would really like to think that's Edward's influence. Yeah. I really like the fact that Edward himself is somebody who, like I said, he cares about his kids. And the, the thing I love about Lewis Edmonds most, he Every time he played a character, he was never playing the same character. He always brought something new and different to each character yeah. he played. And the, the, the great thing, Jewel, about that is that I feel like these are characters that are so often written to be the same. Yeah, in a sense. They really are. They're really written to kind of be the same because they did the same thing for Joan Bennett. <laughs> And they never got her to be able to play a different part until she played Flora. Yeah. You know, <laughs> different shades of it. But Louis, I think as much as anyone, took opportunities with turns yeah. of lines to show them what else he could do. And they were like, oh, thank God. Now we get to write a totally different guy. Good. That's, that's what I was just going to ask you guys. Like, Do you feel like actors like Lewis Edmonds looked at the script and said, you know what? I'll torque I'll twerk this character a bit myself on screen. I think they were twerking a lot. Mm -hmm. Tweaking, sorry. Oh, I I like twerking. I uh, um, I think sure, yes, and I'll tell you why. A, as long as it didn't hurt the ratings, I think Dan Curtis was okay with it. And if it helped the ratings, terrific. But also, as I said before, TV directors don't have a lot of time to talk to actors. Yeah. So they're really, really, really left to their own devices a lot. Yeah, and and I think most of the writers would probably not as 
precious about what they were writing. So I don't think they would have been like, no, you must say this line this way. Or, and the fact that they had, you know, several cast members could see the teleprompter. I'm sure they were like, they're thinking, but oh, I like the way Louis did that line. Let's do more of that. Yes. Well, it's, 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 it is the quintessence of the right kind of collaboration where everyone is kind of picking up on unspoken bits of momentum from other artists and taking a little further. It's essentially, you know, the wrong type of collaboration is where people come in and they say, no, 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 that's wrong. Do it this way. And it's like, okay, Uh, the right type of collaboration is where you go back and you say, you know, I just had a feeling that character could do that, but you really pushed it there. So now I have permission to take that even further. You know, thanks, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really, really, really great job uh, just by the whole cast. And I really love this episode that Gordon picked. Is there anything you guys want to add? Are they nice to you guys? What do you guys say? All right. Yep. Say hi, Frankie. What is his name? Frankie? Frankie, yes. Frankie. How did you get that name for the for the cat? Well, 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 we um <clears throat> he was named by somebody else. And okay. mom had he's actually um my other cat Pasha's litter mate. So they have the same mother but different dads. Okay. And one week winter, mom was like, um the short form is that Frankie had been left and in a in an abandoned trailer to trailer park. Um he was found, and Mom said, hey, it's going to be a rough winter. Can we bring him in? Yes, we did, and here we go. See? What's you guys' favorite scene in this episode? Oh, I I, th- I think when, when Ben Gibbons comes into the drawing room with Topi and he's charming Edward, he's charming Angelique, you know, I think it's just chef's kiss. I agree. Uh, yeah. Gosh, favorite scene in this episode. I I I like seeing Angelique basically proposing to Quentin. I don't know. There's just something mythologically very funny about that. And uh, you, she's gonna you, marry one of these Collins boys. Yeah. The arrival of a brand new character in Victor Van Givens. And we don't even know who he really is. And I think that's one of the best things. And, and, and well, and it also shows the screwed upness of the class issues that the Collins have that, you know, if if you're, you know, don't have the right skin color or whatever, uh, they're just, you know, and gypsies, uh, you know, they're they're just going to be horrible gatekeepers. But. If you have the right accent, including that weird, almost needless bit that he throws in about the throat injury yeah. and so on, uh, uh, if if you if you just wave a few names around, Edward lets you in like that. It's yeah. it's just straight to the front of the line. And I I'm not certain about this, but I I think I've heard that. All of the history is wrong. That, you know, everything that that he says about, you know, I was with Lord Kitchener at this point and this happened at this point, that the years are all off. And the and and at first I thought, okay, well, they're just being lazy writers. Shame on me. Shame on me. I think it was not an Easter egg, but a private joke that they had around the office. I didn't think anybody was going to pick up on this, be watching it 50 years later. Um, that uh, that Edward Edward has no idea what his military history is. All he needs to do is just hear a few names. He's like Pavlov's dog. He's ready to let him in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really, really good episode, uh, Gordon. Patrick, it's your turn to pick the episode, the next All episode. Right. All right. I will. I will. And the episode is, drum roll please, 960. 960. Is is Wednesday night good for you guys? Yes, it is good for me. Okay. I'll see you guys Wednesday at 11. Uh, I have a guest coming up tomorrow. 
You're but, laughing wildly about this guest coming on. What's what's ha- what what don't they know? What are you playing? Well, well she the the lady is um, she works with Bobby Lagosi on their her these TikTok videos. So, ah. so uh, and she she's a dark chat. That's good. I'm going to talk to her about dark chat. We're talk about ben, uh, ben Cross is Barnabas Collins and Jonathan Fritz Barnabas Collins. Um, so nine nine sixty for Wednesday night, guys. Uh, links to Gordon Damaski's Amazon page. Links to the Dark Shadows Day Book of Bounds going to be in the description box. Guys, thank you so much. I had a blast. This was a good one. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Good pick, Gordon. Thanks. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. Bye.